the day uh, roads in and out of Laramie have been closed. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll give you uh, uh, my introduction to entomology for master gardeners. Uh, and, and then from there, uh, some additional information that hopefully will prove useful for you and your career as a master gardener. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I'm kind of prejudiced about uh, insects. I think that they're pretty fascinating creatures. Um, but I know a lot of master gardeners and, and gardeners in general kind of have a dim view of insects, insects unless it's a honeybee or maybe a butterfly as long as it's not the caterpillar that's chewing on the plant. But, um, so I uh, want to just cover some of the basic stuff about insects, uh, you know, what distinguishes them from other arthropods. Uh, and arthropods refers to uh, those uh, creatures that uh, have legs and an external skeleton and uh, are uh, really common and uh, abundant in our world. Uh, things like ticks uh, and mites, uh, those can be problematic for people and uh, entomologists uh, are often asked uh, about those things and so we include them. Uh, but tonight we're going to concentrate on insects and uh, here we can see a spider as compared to an insect. You know, the, the tick and mite have uh, one part bodies and then uh, most adult ticks and mites have eight legs. There's lots of exceptions in the world of arthropods. <clears throat> the spiders, of course, have a two-part body. They have a combined head and thorax, a cephalothorax, and eight legs and an abdomen. And then, of course, our insects uh, have a three-part body as exemplified by this uh, yellow jacket. So uh, it has uh, the three-part body, six legs. As adults, most insects do have wings. Uh, they may be highly modified or reduced, but uh, you can find the evidence of the wings. They have antennae. Uh, so uh, this is probably a review for most of you from uh, uh, when you were uh, in school. You probably learned some basics about uh, insects and other arthropods. I, I like grasshoppers, that's my uh, specialty. Uh, this is a, a illustration that was done by William Stump, who's the plant pathologist at the university back a long time ago now that he did for a publication at the university. Uh, you'll see lots of pictures of grasshoppers because that's what I like. Um, I also like them because they obey all the rules of uh, this. You know, they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The thorax is where wings and legs originate. Uh, grasshoppers, you can really see the separations quite easily, but sometimes you see some insects, that's not quite so apparent. They have a, a big apparent uh, antennae. Uh, and, and so again, uh, they're, uh, they obey all the rules. Now, of course, there are some insects, especially the juvenile or immature stages that don't have those features. Sometimes uh, such as scale insects, uh, the only time they look like an insect is when they first hatch, hatch out of an egg. So uh, insects are also the most abundant and diverse creatures on earth. There's been an over a million species described we think many more to go because we've gotten most of the big easy ones like grasshoppers uh, identified. There's lots of other uh, insects that are much smaller. Uh, they live in difficult places. There's lots of uh, insects and arthropods that live in the soil. Uh, so those uh, can be hard to identify. But uh, uh, if you look at insects, the most of them are uh, in the order Diptera, which are flies. Uh, order Hymenoptera, which are bees, ants, wasps, soft flies, uh, butterflies, and moths. The majority of those will be moths, not the butterflies, but uh, Lepidoptera is the order name for them. Uh, the beetles, they're the biggest, most diverse order of insects. And then uh, what's now called Hemiptera, which used to include uh, Homoptera, or didn't include Homoptera, it was a separate order, but they've now lumped it in there. So it's, it's become a, a very big and very important order for gardens because there's lots of uh, uh, plant pests that are in that order now and there's also some beneficial. So if you look at that uh, and compare over a million insect species with other invertebrates, things like ticks and mites and spiders uh, and other things like crustaceans that live in the ocean, uh, uh, plants, uh, the diversity of plants is highly related to insects because you have insects that feed on them from the roots to the crown 
uh, on the leaves, the seeds, the stems, and then they have insects that feed on all stages of them. And so you can see how it, the insects would become even more diverse as plants became more diverse. You have uh, vertebrates, uh, things with backbones like ourselves, uh, fish, birds, those types of things. So only about 60,000 species of those. And then other life, bacteria and fungi, those types of things. So again, just an overview. Now with that, you know, Wyoming is kind of a difficult climate for uh, insects and other arthropods because we have a lot of uh, cold. We also have a lot of dry and both of those things can be difficult for uh, things to live in, at least uh, for humans, so it can be difficult to live in. But <clears throat> you also think about Wyoming, it, we've got a lot of different habitats. You know, we have from high alpine habitats to the desert basins, uh, coniferous forests, uh, uh, along our streams, the, the broadleaf trees there, uh, lots of grasslands and, and shrublands. So, there's actually uh, estimates of about 15,000 on the upper end species of insects. Uh, in Wyoming, we know there's uh, over 110 species of grasshoppers. And uh, uh, actually at the university, we have a collection of most. There are some that we have not found, but we think are here. And there's some that um, we may think are not separate species, but uh, through genetic analysis, they may become species. <clears throat> So just to compare that, the total number of species of mammals on Earth, and we're mammals, uh, is only, uh, actually I should update this number, I saw a, a more recent one, it was about 5,400. So uh, Wyoming probably has three times the diversity of insect species as we have uh, total number of mammals on Earth. So, uh, or total species of mammals on Earth. And by species, I should define that. Species is, uh, the definition is uh, only uh, members of their own species can mate and produce fertile offspring. Uh, and so, you know, like a mule is a hybrid between donkeys and horses and doesn't produce fertile offspring. So it's not a separate species. <clears throat> there are also have numbers. It's been estimated that insects outnumber humans at about a ratio of 200 million to one. And then on average, there's about 40 million insects on each acre of arable land, I would say. Uh, you're, you're not going to find that many species on, uh, say, an acre of uh, uh, you know, bedrock type of thing uh, uh, up on Greenland. Uh, but uh, in, in our temperate zones, that, that's probably an accurate estimate because there's many insects that are very small and live in, in very uh, uh, hidden areas uh, of our environment. In the U.S., it's estimated that insects also outweigh us by about 400 pounds of, uh, per acre, whereas human biomass is only about 14 pounds per acre. Uh, so again, uh, uh, they're pretty important. Now, why are they so successful? <clears throat> well, this photo here was taken by my uh, uh, old boss, uh, Professor Alex Lachininski uh, in East Africa. This is a, a swarm of desert locust flying through. And so that uh, illustrates one of the, the things that have made them so successful is the ability to fly. Uh, they share that with birds and bats. Uh, the, uh, uh, this helps them exploit new territories and move. Uh, in the case of, of locusts or in, in some of our uh, pest grasshoppers, when they run out of food in the area, if they're adults and wing, they can get up and fly and find new areas to, to land and eat uh, the plants there. Uh, insects have an exoskeleton, and that's also a really good thing to have when you're small. Uh, it gives you uh, a lot of physical protection. It it's also uh, helps them conserve moisture. If you've ever worn a rubber glove, you know how your uh, hands give off a lot of moisture because you take it off and your hands all wet. Uh, if insects had skin like ours, they would dehydrate really rapid. So they have this exoskeleton and it has a coating of waxy uh, 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 compounds on it that help them conserve their moisture. Uh, this is why things like diatomaceous earth can help uh, control pest insects because they come in contact with that and can disrupt that uh, uh, hydrophobic layer and then uh, they'll, they'll dry out and die from that. Um, the small size. Insects don't require a lot of uh, uh, 
food uh, in order to complete their development, you know, being uh, small, uh, they're relatively good at conserving resources and, and uh, turning that into uh, either biomass or more eggs and more offspring. Speaking of offspring, they, most insects have a very high reproductive capacity. So the more likely they have offspring that survives. And then of course, very important for master gardeners is insects relationship with plants. Uh, in many cases, you know, we have a lot of our food plants that require pollination and it's often uh, insect pollination that does it. Now, a lot of our grain crops are of course, uh, uh, wind pollinated such as wheat uh, and corn, they don't require pollination services, but a lot of our other uh, uh, crops and fruits that we like to eat uh, do require pollination. Uh, like I say, many times uh, gardeners kind of have a bad attitude on most insects. Uh, the way I, I look at it is the more you learn about them, uh, the less there is to fear about them, and you realize that still some things don't uh, aren't exactly as they appear. So if you look at this guy, he looks uh, pretty menacing. It looks like he has a stinger on his tail. He has warning coloration even. Black and yellow bright colors often are warnings that uh, either I taste really bad, you don't want to bite me, or I can sting, or I can bite you. Uh, this is actually a very uh, harmless insect. It's a scorpion fly. Uh, they have small chewing mouth parts and they'll uh, eat aphids. Uh, so uh, they are actually a beneficial insect in the garden. Now there are some that uh, are, are uh, a nuisance or, or uh, annoying or can inflict uh, harm uh, like uh, yellow jackets or in this case bed bugs. Uh, you can see here, uh, I think everybody should know what a bed bug looks like because uh, they've become more common in our world. And uh, uh, an adult bed bug uh, can fit anywhere you can slip a credit card into if they're unfed. When they're full of blood, they look about like an apple seed. And then this is uh, the first instar. So they all, all of the stages, and, and I should define instar, it's just a term that we use for insects development. And so first instar is equivalent to the first stage out of the egg. This is uh, how tiny they are. And so you can see how easily they can be transported around. All stages of bed bugs feed on blood. Uh, we also have uh, relatives of those uh, that uh, feed on bats and then also on swallows. So uh, again, it's uh, the more you learn about them, uh, the, the less frightening it can be. Um, when I do school kid programs, I often ask them, what's the most deadly animal in the world? And they'll maybe say, oh, sharks or grizzly bears or something like that. And of course not, it's, it's uh, uh, female mosquitoes that uh, vector uh, diseases such as malaria. You know, estimated to kill between two to three million people a year. Most of those are children under the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so again, uh, uh, these uh, insects, you know, uh, it was only in the 1950s that we eliminated malaria from the United States. So it's, uh, insects can have a, a, a big impact on our lives. I was just in a meeting all day today uh, regarding the funding of uh, mosquito control uh, programs around the state uh, that target specifically uh, the vector of West Nile virus. So again, uh, they, they have an impact on our lives and our budgets. But for gardeners, we often uh, want to think of them in terms of the functions that they do. Uh, in pollination is one of the more important ones. Here uh, are uh, native insects that are very important for pollination are the bumblebees. Uh, this one you can see is just covered with pollen. And then this one is packing two heavy loads of pollen back to its nest. Uh, one of the things that I always uh, uh, see as a big sign of spring is when I get out uh, uh, at this time of year and I can find some past flowers blooming and what uh, the insect they depend on to pollinate them are bumblebees there because they are able to uh, operate in very cool temperatures like uh, that'd probably be a little too cool and lowny today for any bumblebees. But if it's sunny and in the 30s or 40s, and that's too cold for honeybees to fly, it's all right for bumblebees because uh, 
Uh, if you know, bumblebees have a big body. They're also hairy for insulation and they'll shiver and bring their body temperature up to where they can sustain flight. So uh, again, uh, bumblebees uh, uh, and other bees in the family Apidae are, are kind of the superstars of pollination. But we also have native pollinators in the uh, uh, beetles and true flies, like this uh, uh, flower longhorn beetle. Uh, many of the flowers that depend on beetles for pollination, they have uh, sacrificial uh, parts in the flowers. And beetles are often called nests and soil pollinators because they'll chew on the flowers, uh, but they don't chew on the parts that are necessary for pollination. And in the meantime, flower uh, longhorns, they have a very hairy uh, thorax and they can carry that pollen on to the next flower they're going to eat. Same way uh, as these Narcissus flies are hairy. Most of the time, insects that uh, are, are, uh, uh, have a good relationship, a long-term relationship with plants as pollinators, they'll have uh, parts that are hairy. And uh, that uh, hair, it's not really hair like our hair, uh, is very effective at grabbing pollen and then transporting it. Uh, insects are also very important for recycling nutrients. Uh, uh, I heard Chance say that uh, uh, Dr. Youngquist uh, uh, gave you a lecture last week. Uh, so uh, creatures like carrion beetles, that very small uh, uh, organisms or visit the carcasses of bigger organisms, they help uh, disperse and, and, and get that, uh, the nutrients trapped in that uh, animal's body in, back into the soil profile. Uh, you look at ants in you know, a long time, uh, uh, the activity of ants is very important for the formation of soil. You know, they excavate tunnels, uh, they'll move uh, material down into the soil profile. In this case, they're hauling a dead caterpillar down into their nest. So again, uh, it's very important. Uh, dung beetles are very important in grazing lands. Uh, the classic ones are called tumblers. They, they make a ball out of uh, fresh dung that they find suitable and then roll it away. Others in Wyoming, because we have a dry climate, uh, we probably have more of the species that are called uh, uh, dwellers or tunnelers uh, in that uh, some of them will just make a ball inside a cavity inside the, the cow patty and others will dig a tunnel right under the cow patty and then bury the ball there. And they put their larva uh, on that ball and then that's what the larva eats in order to become the next generation of beetle. <clears throat> Uh, insects are critical for the food web. Um, in this case, here's a, a, a spider hunting wasp that uh, they capture and, and paralyze spiders and then take them back uh, either to a hole in the ground or in some cases, some species make a mud chamber and then they provision that with paralyzed spiders and then lay an egg on them. And then the egg hatches and the larva will eat those uh, uh, provisions uh, or in this case, here's a crab spider. They are they hunt without a web, and they ambush things, and they ambush this poor uh, honeybee that came to visit that flower. So, uh, besides other insects eating insects, you also have things like reptiles and amphibians. Here's this little lizard. His eyes are bigger than his stomach. He's trying to eat this big bandwing grasshopper. Uh, you also have most of our songbirds and game birds. They're uh, uh, chicks require uh, the insect protein and fats uh, to fuel that explosive growth that they have to have in order to uh, complete their development and get fledged in order to either migrate south or survive the winter. So I think as you learn more about insects, uh, it becomes easier to love flies. Now, my mother, she was not a big fan of insects. She would have looked at this, this thing and go, oh, it's an ugly, hairy fly, kill it but it's actually a, a beneficial uh, insect in both uh, the adult form and the larva. Uh, the adults feed on uh, uh, nectar and in the process, you know, they have a nice hairy body, they pollinate flowers. And then uh, they search out uh, insects such as caterpillars or grasshoppers and they lay an egg on them. The egg hatches and bores into that uh, insect and eventually kills them. So it helps maintain the populations of these uh, creatures. Uh, you know, robber flies, again, you know, maybe it, it, uh, initially you'd be alarmed if you saw it, but they're just a generalist insect predator that helps keep the populations in, in balance. So they're, they're, they're part of the uh, balance of nature. 
Uh, I guess the point of my whole uh, initial uh, introduction is, can the world survive without insects? If you're a gardener, uh, it certainly would be a very different world. Uh, so we have to learn to, uh, I think, kind of live in harmony with uh, them, uh, recognize which ones can be pests and, and how to deal with them without uh, uh, causing excessive harm to our uh, ones that are beneficial. So do you have any questions at this point in time to, before I go on? I'll probably uh, do go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Scott, you know, a lot of people in Wyoming have to grow in a uh, and maybe you'll get to it later in your presentation and have to grow in a, you know, hoop house or greenhouse or something like that, where access to pollinators is, is tough. What do you suggest for those people and making sure that their plants are getting, you know, pollinated? And I also want to encourage to, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box or, um, or go ahead and, and ask Scott as we go along. But, but Scott, yeah, what do you think of that? Well, uh, it does depend somewhat on the, the crops that you're growing in your greenhouse or hoop house. Uh, there are certain ones uh, such as tomatoes that uh, you know, honeybees have no interest in pollinating tomato flowers and actually are, are very poor at it. Uh, bumblebees are utilized by uh, people for pollinating uh, tomatoes. Uh, they actually, uh, tomato flowers don't produce any nectar. And so that's why bumblebees have a little bit of interest in it. And then they also retain their pollen until they are sonicated by uh, bumblebees. So uh, there's other insects that you can get that can provide some pollination chores. But I think that probably in most greenhouses, at least uh, for uh, tomatoes and other types of, of uh, crops, uh, uh, you know, fruit crops, those types of things, uh, bumblebees are probably the most commonly used uh, uh, insects uh, you know, because number one, they're available and uh, they're good at that job. Uh, if you want to search on the internet, uh, uh, sonication, and that's S O N I C K A or C A T I O N, sonication. It's just the vibration, you know, like the sound because they buzz when they do it. And, and uh, there's some great videos of that where it just a cloud of pollen is released from the tomato flower. And uh, so they're very effective at increasing the size of the fruits and the yields uh, in those uh, situations. So uh, that, that would be my suggestion first is to uh, uh, look at that. If you can't open up your greenhouse and have uh, access for other things, you know, such as kind of flies or, or other um, natural pollinators, I would say bumblebees would be a good substitute. Thank you, Scott. Sure. So, let's see here. So a lot of my talk tonight, you know, this is it coincides with the chapter of your Master Gardener Handbook about you know, kind of general entomology. I'm not really talking about pest control per se, uh, but any kind of management, uh, whether it's you know uh, an insecticide application, whether it's organic or synthetic, uh, there's two major things that you need to know. Is number one is the pest. What pest are you treating? And then of course what crop. You know, because that's uh, a requirement of the labels of those types of things. It's also for cultural control. Uh, you need to know about the life cycle uh, of your insect that you are seeing. You know, is this an insect a pest? If so, uh, what is its life cycle? And then how can I do things to manipulate uh, uh, the environment or, or remove a key part of its uh, habitat that depend on for part of its life cycle, those types of things. So um, really tonight is all about insect identification. And I'll, I'll give you an overview of the insect orders that are of major importance and uh, also a tool about uh, that you can utilize uh, called the plant pest index. So that, that, that should come in handy for gardeners. 
So this is uh, also, you probably heard the term taxonomy. And so that's just, you know, science of classifying organisms. That's specialists who do that are the ones that are describing species to make sure that they're unique. Uh, it also helps humans organize and talk about things by, uh, uh, you know, this is a way for, say, a scientist, he asked me a question uh, uh, about uh, the life cycle of Melanopus sanguinopes, a, a really uh, pestiferous grasshopper that lives in the United States. And, you know, if he asked me about you know, uh, the migratory grasshopper, uh, there are several of the grasshoppers that have that as a common name. So, again, uh, you don't have to become a taxonomist, though, to make Thank it. All the so, you have your free website. So, the basic organization of, of uh, all life goes into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Then there's lots of subs and, and, and uh, supras and all that sort of stuff. But these are really the basic categories. So this is the <laughs> categories for uh, this grasshopper called the snakeweed grasshopper. And so the kingdom is Animalia. Uh, the phylum is Arthropoda, and that's not a misspelling. So it's an arthropod. It belongs to the uh, phylum Arthropoda. Class Insecta, again, an insect belongs to that class. Order is Orthoptera. So uh, tonight we're going to just concentrate on identifying insects mainly to order. Uh, again, family is very important, but uh, that's more detail than we have time for tonight. Uh, you also, to note, uh, you'll see this uh, in, in the uh, more scientific literature, is uh, the, the scientific names of insects. And the genus is kind of like our last names. It's uh, capitalized uh, in either in italics or underlined. And then the species is always lowercase in uh, either underlined or italics. So in this case, this is the uh, snakeweed grasshopper. It's also known as the clown grasshopper. Uh, I think it, there's a, a, in some places it's a rainbow grasshopper. It's a very colorful grasshopper. It's actually a beneficial species because it uh, eats uh, entirely uh, broom snakeweed and a couple other related um, noxious plants that our, our livestock uh, don't eat. And so it helps uh, that from um, um, overcrowding our uh, grazing lands and increasing, uh, it helps maintain the broom snake weed in, in balance with the rest of uh, the grazing plants. So, uh, Hesperocatus virus is its scientific name. It's the only one. It has a relative that also lives in Wyoming. It's called Hesperocatus speciosa. It eats some other types of noxious plants. So, again, uh, this is uh, uh, important information, but we're not going to uh, worry too much about the pass to order level tonight. Uh, that's because uh, uh, you know we don't have the time. As far as getting to genus and species level uh, identification, a lot of times you have to have specialized taxonomic keys if they've been written or an expert assistance. Um, like myself, I'm mainly a grasshopper, person, that's my interest uh, in, in uh, we're fortunate in that many of the insects that are major pests, uh, there's a lot of good references out there for them. A lot of the insects that are not major pests, uh, we don't know a whole lot about. And so that's, uh, you know, there's still a lot to be learned on those. But again, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, if you can get to the family level, so if you're having problems with pest grasshoppers, then the approaches are all the same for all the members of the family accreditate the, the grasshoppers. And so that's sufficient for management. We already talked about the characteristics of, of insects, the adults. Uh, I think maybe I didn't uh, mention the wings. Wings are very important for placing insects into their correct order. So uh, I'll explain that as we go along. Uh, adult insects can have zero, one, or two pairs of wings. Uh, some things like fleas or bed bugs, they no longer need wings. They, wings are just getting in their way. Uh, other things like uh, the uh, true flies, the other dipter, they only have one pair of wings. And then uh, most other insects have two pairs of wings. Now, some, some have lost that, or maybe they're not functional anymore, but they do have that. 
And then you can have stages within insects that have wings and don't have them. So uh, aphids often have an apterous or wingless form. And if you look at this, and as you get more familiar with it, you recognize that this is a, a wingless aphid. She is an insect. She has a three-part body. Here's her head. There's her thorax. She has no wings, but all six of her legs originate off the thorax and her big abdomen. And, and, and so this is, uh, uh, again, like say with insects, you learn, say the first couple of years about all the kind of generalized rules of thumb and then the rest of your life about all the exceptions. So if you look at this and, and uh, you know, you might think, well, is it an immature? No, it's, it's a, actually a stage of, of the aphids that uh, can get on a plant and then they reproduce without uh, sex and they make little clones of themselves. So, and then often with aphids, they have a very complex life cycle. They might have summer hosts and winter hosts and they'll form a wing generation at some point in time that will move between the hosts. So again, it, it, as you get more familiar with them, uh, it, it doesn't become quite so daunting, but uh, insects, uh, like say, they, they keep uh, interested because they're so diverse. Uh, the main body parts that we use as diagnostic characters are the mouth parts. That's very important for uh, gardeners because the mouth parts are what inflict damage on plants if they are plant pests. And the style of damage uh, is reflected in what type of mouth parts they have. Uh, the antennae, the shape and form, the tarsi can be very important, and the wings, of course, number and form. So here are some uh, examples of insect mouth parts. Uh, a lot of insects have mandibles, and sometimes they'll be hidden under what pass for insect lips, like this, this guy over here in the upper left. Uh, he has one mandible kind of hanging down, and so their mandibles move side to side, not up and down like ours. Uh, you have some of the insects that have large projecting mandibles, are very easy to see, like the brown beetle. Uh, you have other insects that have piercing sucking beaks. And so they suck the juices out of plants, or uh, in some cases, the blood out of animals, uh, or, or the blood out of other insects. You have the coiled proboscis, which is kind of a flexible, uh, 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 not so much a piercing, but just a sucking flexible beak and it coils up like a fire hose underneath their uh, uh, face. And then sponging mouth parts, such as the filth flies, like house flies and blue bottle flies have, they uh, uh, can eat liquid food or liquidized food there by uh, uh, regurgitating digestive fluid on food and, and then sucking it back up. So this is why they're called uh, you know, good vectors of disease organisms because of that uh, way they feed uh, they uh, you know, can land on something that's kind of nasty out in your compost pile and then get into your house and land on your sandwich and they'll regurgitate on your sandwich and then suck it back up. So uh, try not to let the flies land on your sandwiches. Antenna uh, can be very important. This is the form of house flies. They have a couple little segmented knobs and then they have a bristle or a rista on there, so they, it's called aristate. Uh, Thread-like or filiform uh, uh, is a common one on grasshoppers and some of the moth species uh, that don't have plumos. Uh, you also have the, uh, most butterflies and many beetles have a clubbed antenna. So out at the end of the segments, they have enlarged clubs. And then plumos or feather-like antenna uh, is uh, found on some beetles and then some species of moth or some, some uh, of the uh, uh, sex of a species of moth. Because sometimes one moth gives off a pheromone, whether it's the male or female, it, it's all, it, it varies between that uh, different species. Sometimes it's the male that has to uh, smell where the female's at, and sometimes it's vice versa. And uh, they have a plumose antenna, and that's where their sense of smell is located. So it gives them more surface area. The tarsi. Uh, sometimes it can give you a clue about where an insect lives. This is a predaceous diving beetle, so its hind tarsi are modified for swimming. And then this is a like a June beetle or a, a May beetle uh, chafer. Uh, uh, they have these uh, uh, tarsi that are good for walking. Um, in the case of, of these uh, 
insects, they have a, a femur and then a tibia and then tarsal segments. And the way they're counted is the one closest to the tibia or the body of the insect is one, two, three, four, five. And this beetle, uh, it, in many cases for beetles to identify them past just the order to get them to their correct family, you need to be able to count their segments. So in this case, this is a six, six, five pattern. And that can be important. Uh, uh, like this leafhopper only has two segments. And then of course this uh, wasp has five. So again, uh, it, you know, sometimes if you're trying to identify insects, it might require looking at them in, in detail with magnification. Um, <clears throat> to identify them uh, from immature forms, uh, you, you need to familiarize yourself with them. Uh, I, I'm not gonna cover it in detail, but I did wanna point the, out how different they can be. Uh, so this is an immature dragonfly, and then this is the adult. The immature lives in water and is a, a, a voracious predator in the water whereas the uh, adult dragonfly is probably the best flyer in the insect world and is also predatory. So again, uh, very different between the two forms. Now, most insects go through two types of metamorphosis in their development. Uh, so grasshoppers, uh, they are a good example of simple metamorphosis. So when they hatch out of the ground from the egg pod, and, and most of our species, especially our pest species, they overwinter as an egg, pod, egg pod in the upper soil surface, and then they'll hatch out. And when they hatch out, they look like a miniature of the adult. They lack wings and they're not sexually mature. And they grow in stages because they have an exoskeleton. And so that's a hard covering and they have to molt and get out of that hard covering and in between each growth stage. And they usually do it by crawling up on vegetation and hanging upside down and having gravity help them crawl out. And their uh, uh, soft body when they initially emerge from that and they have to kind of inflate their body and then harden and, and then they're, they're good to go again until uh, most species uh, in good conditions will molt uh, anywhere every five to seven days. And then eventually they reach their uh, uh, adulthood uh, now, some grasshoppers have small non-functional wings, but most of our species have uh, four wings and can fly, or at least uh, uh, maybe not great flyers, but some of them can fly long distances. So again, uh, this is a simple metamorphosis. Now, in contrast, we have complete metamorphosis exemplified by butterflies. Uh, and beetles, uh, the, uh, those types of things. This is an example using a butterfly. So egg hatches out, it's a caterpillar. It does have an exoskeleton, but it's more soft and leathery. They have to molt that in order to grow. Uh, they usually turn right around and eat it. They eat the molt. Uh, so they start out small and then grow. And when they reach their full size as an immature, then they will pupate in a chrysalis. Uh, if it's covered with silk, like it's a moth, then that's a cocoon. Uh, a pupa is kind of our universal term that works well for insects that go through complete metamorphosis. And then they undergo this huge transformation in their body to the adult form. So they go from being you know, kind of worm-like and having chewing mouth parts to having a flexible proboscis and wings. Quite a, quite a big change. And that's what metamorphosis means. You know, big, big change in form. Now, uh, beetles are another one that goes through complete metamorphosis. And this is an example of the emerald ice borer. It's an invasive pest in the US. It's uh, causing a lot of uh, damage to ice trees uh, in the wild and also in our, our cities and towns. Uh, its larva are vermiform, legs, no legs, and it's worm-like. So verma, you know, you might have heard the word vermiculture. You know, I think that uh, uh, relates to the root of that as vermiform or worm-like. Uh, so they live under the bark of an ash tree, and they don't need legs. They're just chewing and eating their way under the bark in the canyon. Vermiform, not even a head capsule, just hooks. This is a housefly maggot, is what they uh, look like. Uh, you've probably all seen them at some point in time, maybe not this magnified. Those are not the eyes, those are called spiracles, and they allow oxygen into the body. 
So they're generally head first in food that they are uh, uh, turning into liquid with their digestive fluid and then scraping with the hooks. They have these little projections on their body that they can kind of wiggle around and, and move. And then when they get done with their growth, they pupate within their last larval exoskeleton. Uh, you probably all seen those. It kind of looks like a oversized rice crispy that's kind of dark brown. And then they emerge from that as our good old friend, the housefly. Vermiform with a head capsule, no legs. I think everybody who's ever grown a house plant has probably seen the fungus gnats, at least the adult form. The, the larva form, they live, of course, in uh, uh, the soil. A lot of times, if it's uh, a little too heavily watered or has a little too much organic matter, you can start to get fungal hyphae, and that's what they like to live on. And uh, then this is the adult form, which you'll see often flitting around the windows around your uh, house plants. Compote form. Now, you don't have to remember all these terms. I just want you to be kind of familiar with all these variations. So this is a very happy uh, seven-spotted lady beetle larva. Uh, I, I've had over the years, uh, I've been doing this job since about 2003. Uh, I've had a lot of lady beetle larvae submitted saying, you know, what are these things? Uh, and hopefully they, they ask me before they do any treatment because uh, I consider them uh, beneficial in that they help naturally reduce populations of aphids. You, you can see this one's very happy. He's surrounded by all sorts of food. This is the adult form. So again, uh, you're getting familiar with uh, the uh, both is, is a good thing. Uh, one of the uh, recommendations on a reference that I think all gardeners should have has good photos of eggs, larvae, pupa, and the adults. If anybody's ever turned over a, a shovel full of uh, earth uh, uh, where grass is growing has probably run into uh, uh, a scarab beetle larva. Uh, almost all of them uh, take this position when you disturb them and expose them uh, uh, from their soil where they're chewing and eating their way through the soil in the grass roots. Uh, this is the larva of a thin line June beetle. I don't know why it's that color. I need to adjust the color on that, but uh, it, it has legs, but it's relatively limited in motion. Like say it has powerful chewing mouth parts and it goes through and it's chewing on the turf. If you have badly infested uh, turf with lots of chafers or June beetles, uh, uh, the big grubs at, uh, in springtime can be very attractive to things like skunks and they can get in there and tear up the turf. Uh, it's easy to do because the roots have been severed and, and uh, they'll tear up the turf hunting for those grubs. The click beetles are another one that uh, are pretty common in, in turf and can be a major pest in, in cropland, especially if it's been, um, let's say, a, a pasture or grassland and then it's put back into row crops. Uh, in the case in Wyoming, uh, one of the more serious pests of this family of beetle is the sugar beet wireworm. And it, so it has a lateral form, kind of a long cylindrical hardened body with short legs, and they'll chew into uh, you know, roots of, of plants. And so they're pretty damaging. The adults are not really all that damaging. It's the larva form that does the damage. Anybody who's ever played with a click beetle, uh, you, you put them on their back and they kind of struggle and they have a kind of a little mechanism back here. They'll pop it and if they're lucky, they land on their feet and they can walk off. If not, they have to struggle again some more and then pop it and, and do that until they land on their feet. The caterpillars of our butterflies and moths have uh, rusiform uh, uh, caterpillars. They have six thoracic legs. Uh, so those uh, in this caterpillar, the heads up here, they kind of bend it down. And then right behind those are what's going to be the adult legs. So they're the, uh, on the thoracic segments. And then they have what are called abdominal prolegs, five or fewer of them. And that's what they use for hanging onto the plant and moving around on the plant. And on those kind of fleshy projections, they have what are called crochets or hooks that they can grab a hold of that vegetation. And so this is, uh, you can see here, it has four here, kind of mid-abdomen and then a pair at the end of the abdomen. Uh, 
so five or fewer, remember that, because the next one that we have are soft flies. So they're in the order Hymenoptera. They are with the bees, wasps, and ants, uh, but they're kind of the oldest members of that order, and uh, many of them are plant feeders. And their larvae uh, look very similar to caterpillars. Uh, they have six or more pro legs. Uh, they often have these kind of funny eyes, like a little bee black dot on their eyes, uh, in contrast to, say, a, a caterpillar or a butterfly or moth. On their fleshy pro legs, they don't have any crochets. Now, most of these are fairly small insects, although there are a few of them, like the elm saw fly, that can get pretty big, where you uh, wouldn't need to have magnification to look at the pro legs to see if crochets were there. Uh, so in this case, this is uh, the, uh, the plant feeders. Uh, the pine saw flies are ones that can sometimes be problems in Wyoming uh, due to the defoliation. Uh, pine trees, um, you know, they keep their needles for longer than just one season. And, and so they invest more energy into those needles. Uh, now, there are some of the species of pine saw fly that uh, attack uh, only the older needles, and so they're not quite so damaging to their host as the ones that uh, feed on all the needles and defoliate a pine tree. That can be really hard on, on pine trees. So I think at this point in time, you know, it's a little after five, so that's an hour in. I thought we'd maybe just take a short five-minute break, stand up and stretch, and then we'll finish off this portion of the uh, uh, introduction to the orders. Uh, are there any questions at this point in time? Uh, I'm, I'm going fairly fast, but we've got a lot. We've got a whole semester of entomology to cram into uh, uh, just three hours. Anybody have any questions for Scott? So, Scott, I was just wondering. Do you think it's worthwhile for like a you know lady? like to turn loose ladybugs, is that something that would be beneficial? Um, and can you think of any other biological control examples like a ladybug towards uh, um, aphids or something else like that? Yeah, uh, I know, um, you know if, if you turn the, the lady beetles uh, loose into your garden or even you know, like your hoop house, if you don't have a population of aphids already, you know, they're just, you know, they might eat a few and then they're going to uh, want to leave because what, they, what they're looking for is a big population of aphids to lay their eggs by. And so that will ensure a good uh, food source for their larvae. And, you know, the adult lady beetles are uh, highly mobile. Uh, and uh, so if you don't have the resources that they want, they'll take off on you. I think a better uh, biocontrol that you can put into your garden or hoop house uh, are the, uh, uh, the uh, green lace wings and brown lace wings that they sell. Many times they'll sell the eggs themselves. Uh, and, and so when they hatch out, they can't fly away. Uh, they start off, uh, they'll be eating things like uh, uh, plant feeding mites, like spider mites, uh, the eggs of other insects. Um, and then as they get bigger, then they get pretty voracious on aphids. And so you can put them in there and uh, you don't have to worry about them getting away. And they'll, they'll eat more than just aphids. You know, uh, lady beetles, a lot of times, are pretty much aphid specialists. So I, I think that uh, uh, I recommend the lace ones as far as uh, a supplemental uh, biological control that you can put out there. And they're pretty broad spectrum, and uh, they don't fly off until they're adults. And if there's if there's food for them, uh, when they do become adults, they'll stick around and lay eggs, more eggs. So uh, that would be my recommendation, chance over lady bees. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's. Uh, hang on, hang on, Scott. We got one more question. Okay. I'm not hearing anything. Hang on just a sec. Go ahead, keep going. Okay. 
No, I, I still can't hear. You'll have to uh, relay it, Chance. I can't hear. It's, it's okay. Uh, she's just sharing with the class here. Um, hang on. Just... Oh. Okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, uh, you know, like I say, this, we'll take a little five minute break. This is a short break. Uh, uh, you can get up, stretch, grab, drink water because uh, you've been sitting for an hour already. And then we'll come back. We'll finish the introduction, uh, uh, an overview, and then I'll get into some stuff that may be of more use to you for identification. Okay, thanks, Scott.
Everybody get back to their seats yet? Yeah, I think we're good here. Um, we're just getting set back down and uh, I think you can start whenever you want, Scott. Okay, sounds good. So tonight I'm just going to cover uh, the insect orders that probably are most important to gardeners. Uh, at this point in time, there's uh, about 31 different orders recognized by science, but we won't cover that many. We're just going to cover the ones that are most obvious uh, or most important uh, to gardeners. <clears throat> now, most of these, uh, I'll give you the scientific name and then also the common name. Uh, that, uh, what helps me remember what the, uh, the scientific names uh, uh, are, you know, they're descriptive, but you have to either speak Greek or Latin, which uh, scientists all used to be able to do when they were naming these things. And so uh, the, to me, I, I still like to kind of give a, a rough translation. You'll see a lot of these order names have uh, the P-T-E-R-A at the end of them, and that means wing. So uh, the wings, shape, and form are very important for grouping insects into their different orders. And, uh, now, again, like I said, uh, grasshoppers are, are some of my favorite insects. Orthoptera means straight wings. Uh, uh, if you've ever been to the orthodontist, that means straight teeth. So, uh, now, like I said, insects are always full of exceptions. You know, most grasshoppers, they do have relatively straight wings. But here's an angle wing Katie did, who's also a member of Orthoptera. So, uh, <clears throat> there's lots of variation. Uh, most of our grasshoppers uh, are what are considered the shorthorn ones, the prolifera, and that shorthorn refers just to their antenna length. Uh, you also have pygmy grasshoppers uh, that are very small and usually found around streams and, and springs and those types of things. But these are the real problematic ones in that they can damage our crops or damage our rangeland. Uh, so again, they're a fairly important uh, species to uh, gardeners. You also have included in Orthoptera the longhorn members, uh, and that refers to the long antenna that most of them have, except for the mole cricket. Now, I've never found a mole cricket in Wyoming. It's an important pest of turf back east, especially golf greens. I guess it can do a lot of damage there. They, they dig uh, in through the ground, uh, hence the name, the common name of mole cricket. They have front legs modified for digging. Now, you'll notice that most of the orthoptera, uh, I won't say all, there's always exceptions, but uh, the vast majority have enlarged hind legs for jumping. And uh, in the case of Jerusalem crickets, they're not a very good jumper, but they can kick and they'll use those spines as uh, defense. So uh, uh, you've probably all seen uh, Jerusalem crickets. They have uh, probably more common names than any other insect that I know of. Uh, sand puppy, child of the earth, potato heads, uh, those types of things. Uh, this is actually uh, the common name for this creature is a Mormon cricket. It's an adult female. She has a sword-like ovipositor that she uses to stick her eggs in the ground. Uh, and, and like say that, you know, she, she's actually not of that faith and she's not a cricket. She's a flightless katydid. She has really reduced wings up under here that's structure called the pronotum. Uh, and so sometimes they can be real problematic uh, the early Mormon settlers in the Great Salt Lake Valley had uh, uh, tremendous problems with them destroying their crops. Orthoptera used to include the mantis, but now they've been given their own order, Mantodia. So they have these raptorial front legs. And in Wyoming, we actually had two small native species to our grassland areas. But uh, in probably the past 15 years, uh, the European mantid has just spread all over. It's not only in towns, I've seen it uh, like in a, a kid's field day out north of Lusk, 15 miles north of Lusk out on uh, the prairie uh, in, in a, a stream area, uh, there were uh, European mantids. So uh, we do have them in the state. <clears throat> uh, Orthoptera used to include the walking sticks. I think there's more walking sticks around than we know about because they have such effective camouflage. Uh, they've been given their own order Phasmatodea now. Uh, they're not really considered problematic. Uh, most of the time they live in uh, trees and shrubs, 
where their camouflage is effective. They kind of look like a bare little stub of a branch and they have very small chewing mouth parts and they probably do chew on the leaves somewhat. But you got to remember that the leaves of most plants, well, that's expendable tissue and most uh, plants can lose some of their leaves and, and not be seriously harmed. So again, in most cases, these are uh, you know, not a problem for uh, gardeners, but you will encounter them. In Lamy, there's a house that uh, has a, a large, uh, uh, pretty good sized hedge near it. And in the falls, a lot of times, for some reason, you'll get a lot of walking sticks that will gather on the side of the attached garage. That's about the only place I know that is reliable for producing walking sticks in land. <clears throat> the order Dermaptera. So again, skin wing is what that refers to. Uh, the, the whole order has a common name of called earwigs. Our most uh, common and probably problematic one that we have is an introduced species called the European earwig. Here is a female and a male. Uh, most insects, the males are smaller, uh, and, and this is because the females will produce eggs, and so to be physically larger, they can carry more eggs. Uh, they have these circe. Uh, on, uh, you know, some insects have circe that are much smaller and flexible. These have large uh, pincer-like ones, and they will try to pinch you if you pick them up, but they're fairly weak. I mean, you know, they don't draw blood or anything like that. <clears throat> Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, they were introduced accidentally and actually more of our species in the U.S. are introduced than are native now. So uh, it's problematic. You know, we, uh, a lot of times when you bring in an insect without its predators or pathogens or types of things, they become a pest like the uh, emerald ash borer I talked about. So again, uh, this is one uh, Kind of an interesting creature in that it provides some parental care for its offspring, unlike most insects. Uh, and in some cases, it can be beneficial if it's eating aphids, but in other cases, it can be very damaging because it can chew on uh, forming fruit. Uh, and, and, and like I say, can be a real nuisance in the late summer and early fall entering houses. Thysinoptera, the fringe wings or thrips, it's always plural. So if you see one, it's not a thrip, it's a thrips. Uh, you have uh, uh, several species that can cause problems on plants due to their feeding. They usually scrape the plant surface and then suck up the fluids. There are some that, that usually are boldly marked that are actually predatory. They prey on the eggs of things like spider mites or other insects, and so they're not plant feeders. But uh, the ones like western flower thrips, grass thrips, onion thrips, uh, those types of things, uh, tobacco thrips, uh, can be real problematic on plants. They're, they're very small. Uh, most of them are from one millimeter to some species up to two millimeters. <clears throat> Just an interesting thing to keep in mind, uh, uh, the size range of insects. Uh, this is uh, scaled all to size. And so this is Megathregma mamaropene. Uh, it's a one of the second smallest insect, there's a, a insect that's actually smaller. It's uh, considered one of the fairy flies. And they're not a true fly, they're a, a type of um, wasp and they are an egg parasitoid. And uh, so they're very small. This is a paramecium, this is an amoeba. And so this insect is about that same size as these single celled organisms. <clears throat> uh, they uh, attack thrips eggs and so the female will lay her egg inside the egg of a thrips, and then it will complete its development entirely within that egg. There's many egg parasitoids out there. Uh, some of them can actually be uh, uh, purchased and put out uh, to help control pests. This is an example of a, a trichogramma. Uh, they belong to the family trichogrammidae, uh, like many of the egg parasitoids. And they specialize in attacking moth eggs. And so this is a, a, like a tomato hornworm or a tobacco hornworm moth egg. And here's a dime. And from that single moth egg, 28 of this trichogramid species emerge. And then they would go out and search for more moth eggs to attack. The order Hemiptera, or true bugs, half wing is what that refers to. And uh, the uh, members of Hemiptera used to all, if they had wings, had that feature. 
Now, bed bugs belong to this group, but they don't have uh, uh, wings, functional wings, but other members did. So box elder bugs or chorid or uh, minute pirate bugs, you can see this two textured wing. Uh, they now, uh, they're still in Hemiptera, but they've been brought in, uh, uh, the Hemoptera have been brought into them. The Hemipterans, um, if they have the first segment of their beak attached to their face, they're generally a plant feeder. If it's freely hinged at the front of the face, they're generally a predator. So you can see out in your garden, you know, cause there's actually uh, like stink bugs. Some of the stink bugs are a big plant pest and other stink bugs are actually beneficial predators. So again, that, this is a, a something, you know, you need to get a pretty close view to them and, and do some more identification, but it, it's a quick way to kind of separate them out between the predator, uh, predatory ones and the plant feeders. Now, Homoptera has been moved into Hemiptera, and Homoptera is a whole big order of plant pests. It was a big order of plant pests. They still are plant pests, but they're now in Hemiptera. Uh, they go through simple metamorphosis, as seen by here. This is a nymph next to the adult. Homoptera means same wing, and that, that their front wing and their hind wing were similar in size and shape. They have piercing sucking mouth parts too, and it, it's jointed at where the head joins the thorax. And so instead of being on the front of their head, like the hemipterans, they had it back here. And it's generally short. And it most, I don't think there's any homopterans that uh, feed on either other insects or, or humans. They're all plant feeders or you know, other animals. Uh, so they're all plant feeders. <laughs> Now, the, the homoptera has the same wing, uh, uh, in, and like I say, they've been moved into uh, that. But that includes the aphids. So, you know, there's like over 1,400 species of aphids in North America, and many of them have a winged form and they have a wingless form. And you generally, the best way to identify them is to know the plant that you're seeing them on at the time of year, and then figure out uh, based on some of the references that I'll, I'll tell you about which one you've got. And it can be important to know, you know, in some cases it's like, well, you can do an insecticide treatment that's labeled for uh, uh, aphids and it will just say aphids uh, and that plant and you'd be okay. But in other cases, you can do things like cultural control by say eliminating the uh, winter host or summer host of that particular aphid that's giving you problems. Uh, Homoptera includes the cicadas. Uh, you might have heard on the news uh, that this year is uh, 17 years after the last emergence of the 10th brood of the 17 year old locust and it's the biggest brood of that locust. We have cicadas in, in Wyoming. Uh, most of them only maybe take uh, 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 the great gra giant grassland pea, uh, cicada it's probably uh, five years, if I remember right, five, four to five years to, to complete its development. Uh, but then we have other smaller species that uh, will emerge after two or three years feeding on tree roots and, and uh, it can attract attention because uh, when they do the emergence after spending that long in the soil, uh, they have one thing on their mind and that's mating and finding mates and they, a lot of them, they make uh, noises. And uh, so that's, uh, uh, you, you'll hear them more often than you'll see them. <clears throat> they can be problematic. Uh, the tree feeding immature stages uh, are sucking juices out of the roots. And, you know, they think that most plants can compensate for that. Uh, the adults can be problematic in that they have a sharp ovipositor. And they'll cut slits in the twigs of uh, the host trees and then lay their eggs inside that. The eggs then stay there for a while and develop and then will hatch and emerge and then fall from the tree to the ground where then they'll burrow into the soil to feed on the tree's roots. So uh, kind of an interesting thing, they can damage uh, the host plant that way. Homoptera includes white flies. You know, uh, chance are saying that uh, uh, people who are going uh, in, inside of hoop houses or greenhouses uh, generally, you can have pretty favorable conditions for plants, but those conditions with high humidity and, and warmth can also favor white flies, and they can be a big problem inside of, of uh, uh, hoop houses. They're very small insects, uh, 
and this is the leaf it's covered with them. They suck on the uh, uh, plant uh, uh, phloem and produce honeydew. You can see here uh, the sugary substance that they produce. <clears throat> Other uh, members of Homoptera also produce uh, honeydew, the brown scales do. These are the insects that are really only the first stage out of the egg looks like an insect. Once the, especially the females attach to the plant and sink their mouth parts into that, they'll molt and they uh, won't move anymore. And so like soft scales will feed on the phloem and in return, sometimes the ants will protect them from predators or parasitoids of them. And uh, in return, they get the honey. Uh, the hard scales as exemplified by this San Jose hard scale, uh, uh, probably more common in Wyoming are the oyster shell scales. Uh, they, once they've found a, a place on a plant, they will attach with their mouth parts and then molt and cover themselves with a hard waxy substance. And so it makes it really difficult to control them once they get there. So again, uh, uh, then the males of this, this particular species, they will uh, emerge out from under the scale, uh, transform into a winged version that uh, will go around and, and then mate with the attached females. And so that's uh, uh, like say the scale insects, they really don't look much like an insect unless you see the very first stage out of the egg. The mopter included the mealybugs, which can be a big problem. In Wyoming, uh, we have one that uh, causes problems on barley occasionally in the western part of the state, the Hanson barley mealybug. Uh, we also have a uh, species that can cause an outbreak on smooth brome, uh, irrigated uh, pastures and hay fields occasionally, and then in greenhouses and hoop houses, you can also get uh, sometimes outbreaks of um, mealybugs. You want to be real careful if you bring in plant material that you don't bring in any pests, and so do really close inspections because that's generally how they get moved around is, is through the plant tree. Coleoptera uh, are the beetles. And it's thought that Aristotle was the one that came up with that name. It means sheath wing. And you can really see how uh, apt that is in this, just uh, looking at these metallic wood boring beetles. Uh, uh, this picture is taken from the insect gallery at the University of Wyoming. So uh, if you have a good chance in the future to visit that, it's, it's not a, a, a you know, a, a big gallery, but it does have some neat displays. Um, these are Wyoming species here, the smaller ones, these are tropical. And it really uh, shows how the front wing has been modified into a sheath to protect the hind wing. So uh, you, you, to, to fly, they lift the front wing up and out of the way and then just depend on the hind wings for their flight. So beetles, they all have chewing mouth parts, both as larvae and as adults. And then the adults, their front wings uh, are are modified in the sheath and they meet in a straight line. One of the largest families of beetles actually doesn't have that big a front wing. They're, they're abbreviated, they're the rogue beetles, but they have the functional hind wing that folds up under there. So again, like say insects have lots of variation and uh, always exceptions. But that, that straight line down the back, that separates them from say uh, the true bugs or hemipterans they overlap their wings, so they don't have that straight line. So this is a beetle. So what kind of mouth part does it have? Well, if, if you folks were in front of me, uh, I, I could ask that and, and maybe get an answer. Uh, so it kind of looks like a beak, but it's not flexible. Uh, it doesn't have a joint like a, a beak a hemipteran would have, and its antenna are out there. And this is a weevil. And so it, it is a, a type of beetle, uh, a family within the order Coleoptera. It has chewing mouth parts on the end of that. So they have mandibles out there on the end. European chestnut beetle. So the order Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, and that refers to scale wing, Lepidoptera. And that's how they get the coloring pattern on their wings. If you've ever held a butterfly or a miller moth and, and you know, you let it go, and it's like, there's dust on my hand. Those are the scales that have come off. And, and so again, uh, if you look at them under high magnification, you can start to see how they're uh, like shingles or scales. 
And then uh, if you zoom in with an electron micrograph, this is what they look like close up. So there's the membrane of the wing. And then here are the flattened uh, scales. The neuropter or lace wings. Uh, so green and brown ones are, are pretty common in Wyoming. Uh, the larva, uh, if you've never noticed them before, they look like little alligators with big, long uh, mandibles and they're voracious predators. If you see these on your plants, that's a good sign because then you've got the adults. And they think that they lay their eggs on the end of these stalks. So the first one out doesn't eat his brothers and sisters. So that's, uh, they are very voracious. And they start out, like say, uh, not just eating um, you know, aphids. They're probably a little too small to do that. But uh, <clears throat> other insect eggs or mites, those types of things. And then they work their way up to eat, eating anything they can catch with their mandible. <clears throat> Word of diptera, true flies. They have two wings. The front wings are their functional wings. And then their hind wings have been modified in these structures called halteres. So that's uh, how you can identify them. Uh, they have the, this uh, front wings as their functional wings. And then the reduced ones. This is a crane fly. Uh, when I was a kid, I thought they were giant mosquitoes. But they actually, the adults, uh, in most cases, they, they can't even take a drink of water. Their uh, mouth parts are non-functional. They just um, mate and lay eggs, and, and that's their uh, life cycle as an adult. The order diptera includes things like flower flies. You probably all notice these on flowers. Uh, in, in many cases, they mimic wasps. They have uh, black and yellow or other bright coloration. Uh, they only have two wings, and they have a thick junction between their uh, thorax and their abdomen. So that helps distinguish them immediately from the wasps. Um, uh, mosquitoes uh, are certainly ubiquitous. Most of the time, you know, mosquitoes, uh, the males will feed on flower for nectar, and the females will also take nectar for an energy source. But most species require a blood meal to uh, complete their uh, uh, egg production. And then you have other things that are often considered pests uh, or filth flies, like the green bottle fly, that are uh, relatively effective pollinators. You can see this green bottle fly is just covered with pollen after feeding on the flower. And then you have others that are generalized predators. The flower fly is probably one of the best ones you can have in your garden uh, because the, the adults are pollinators. And with the exception of a couple species, the larvae are actually predatory. They have a vermiform without a head capsule larvae. And so they crawl around on that plant, essentially blind, but they find aphids and then suck the juices out of them. So uh, they are a, 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 a very beneficial insect to have in your garden. I'm an option. Membrane wing is what that refers to. Bees, ants, wasps, and salt. Now, Hymenoptera, the majority of the species are, are pretty small, and we refer to them as non-stinging wasps. But these aphids would disagree because many of them are what are called parasitoids, in that uh, in, unlike a parasite that lives at the expense of its host, a parasitoid eventually kills its host. And so in this case, they're inserting an egg into the body of an aphid. These are aphidious wasps. So they swing their abdomen up under and stick that egg in that aphid. And then the uh, larva hatches and will eat the non-vital parts first. And when it's completed its development, it will pupate inside the body of the aphid. And it'll be all puffy and silk lined on the inside. And so if you're looking through your plants and you're going, oh my gosh, I've got aphids. If you see these amongst your aphids, these little white uh, mummies, they're called, uh, that's a good sign. You know, if, if you're interested in biological control, you can't have zero tolerance for your pests because you have to have enough of them around to support your biocontrol agents. So after they've completed their development in there, they use their little tiny mandibles to chew an escape hatch in the body of the mummy and pop out and start the whole process over again. Uh, the hymenopter includes stinging wasps. Uh, in Wyoming now, uh, I think since 2009 is what I found out. Uh, I thought it was later than that, but a friend of mine who's an insect enthusiast uh, 
uh, after uh, published an article in Barnyards and Backyards about uh, having uh, European paper wasps submitted, he said, well, I took pictures of those in 2009. I said, well, you didn't send them to me. Uh, so this is a new introduced uh, uh, species of insect. Um, it's re related to paper wasps rather than yellow jackets that are more problematic for us. Um, they have golden antenna. Uh, they have the bright yellow and black coloration that's warning. Uh, don't mess with me, I can sting. Uh, they make an open nest rather than a covered nest like uh, aerial yellow jackets, which are the ones you're most likely to see. The most problematic species are the Western yellow jackets. They live uh, usually underground. They take over, say, an old rodent burrow and they excavate that as the nest grows. And, and so there's a cavity in the earth with a nest just like that in it, uh, but you can't really see it. But they're highly protective of the entrance. And so they're the ones that are most likely to sting people in the, the Rocky Mountain West because you, know, you can come across their nest and uh, disturb them and not even know it. And they don't hesitate to sting. So uh, Western yellow jacket is our number one problem for stinging. Um, and not to include the ants. Uh, most of the ants that you see are the uh, workers. They're wingless and sterile. Um, many ants have strong relationships with aphids. They treat them almost like livestock. Uh, in return for the protection, the aphids provide the ants with honeydew. Uh, you can see here, this is a really good diagnostic character of an ant. It has this elbowed antenna. So sometimes you'll see the uh, uh, winged ants, the males and females, uh, that uh, do reproductive flights. And they'll have a uh, uh, diagnostic character of the uh, jointed antennae. And they'll also have uh, the segments on the abdomen where it joins the thorax, either one hump or two hump. And I think I'll show uh, this. So there's the wasp waist. And then you can see here, this is a, a true wasp. It doesn't have the hump. And then these have a, a little hump right here. So that's, uh, if it has just one hump, it is a formicinine ant. And they can defend by spraying formic acid at you. If it's uh, the two hump variety, they can sting and bite. So Hymenoptera, uh, they have four wings. So, you can see here, it looks like it only has two, but it has two separate bases. And then these are attached by little tiny hooks to each other. So this is a European hornet, uh, a big one. So it's nice to take a photo of. So there's the front wing. And then there's the outline of the hind wing. And the hind wing is usually much smaller than the forewing. So the hymenopter have four wings and a wasp waist and the dipterans that mimic them for protection because say a bird is tried to eat a wasp and got stung in the process, it might look at a fly and say, oh, it's got that yellow and black coloration. I don't want to take a chance. And so that's uh, how you can distinguish them. Only two functional wings. So I already talked about the saw flies. The saw flies get that name from the females having a saw-like ovipositor. They don't have the wasp waist. And uh, uh, the males often have these really ornate uh, feathery type antenna when they emerge from their cocoons. So really the, the goal of this was just to kind of familiarize you with uh, insects that you might encounter um, and the importance of identification because it's the first step for integrated pest management. So say if you're out in your garden, you've got your zucchini there and you see uh, one is a squash bug and one is a predatory stink bug, you know, before you reach for your can of raid, you wanna make sure that you have a pest and not a beneficial. So that's, that's the goal of it tonight. And one of the, the best books for gardeners that I can think of uh, was Garden Insects in North America. Uh, and now it's been replaced by the Garden Insects of North America second edition. So it's even more complete. Uh, unfortunately, they ran out of time when they were doing the second edition and didn't uh, get a chance to include probably the best part about this book for gardeners is the plant pest index. And uh, 
I think I sent this to Rachel, I think, didn't I? The Garden Insects Plant Pest Index. I, I can also attach it to the chat box and you can download it. And so what that is, is uh, most gardeners know the plants that they're looking at. So then you'll look at the plant and based on the damage that you're seeing, it will give you uh, the most likely suspects. And then you can look in the book uh, at the actual pictures of all stages of that insect, including the damage that they caused to the plant. Um, so Garden Insects in North America is a very reasonably uh, priced book. Uh, I think it's got over 1,200 colored plates in it. And then combined with uh, the author uh, giving me the, the Garden Insects uh, uh, plant pest index that was supposed to accompany this, uh, it makes a great uh, reference for you. So I will go ahead and upload that file just in case. Let's see, I can do that in the chat box. Are there any questions? Let's see here. I find garden insects. There we go. So we're going to do um, another short presentation on the damage that insects do to plants and the kind of the terminology that's used by that book. There we go. So normally uh, when I do this in person, uh, we uh, also do a um, how to use a dichotomous key. And so the other thing that we're going to do tonight before the end of the class is I'm going to give you a demonstration on an interactive key that you can utilize to identify insects that work. And then the principles of that behind that key can be applied to other uh, uh, keys that are available for, say, the beetles or, or uh, bumblebees and those types of things. Let's see. So the next one I'm going to do is arthropod plant damage. And then that should take us to about six. And we'll give you another break. And then we'll do the interactive ID. And uh, then we'll, uh, I'll show you your homework and that uh, you'll, you'll have to utilize that interactive ID in, in order to do, uh, and uh, also the uh, uh, plant pest index. And so then uh, next time you meet, uh, Chance will, will be able to uh, give you your grade. So if there's no questions, I'll go ahead and start on this. All right, you know, notice I didn't say insect plant damage because there's actually other uh, types of creatures that are not insects that cause plant damage, things like mites uh, that do it too. So I wanted to include those because uh, you're certain to encounter those out in your garden. And you've already seen this picture, but it should make some sense to you why it's important because the insects that have chewing mouth parts are going to cause different feeding damage than say insects that have a piercing sucking beak or insects that have mouth parts that cannot inflict plant damage directly. So again, uh, this is important. You know, I talked about beetles. This is Colorado potato beetle. Uh, it, larva and adults of beetles have chewing mouth parts. They uh, can be very destructive on the leaves and stems. Certainly uh, things that attack leaves are not quite as destructive as the insects that attack the roots or the trunk or, or uh, the fruits or the saleable parts of the plants, but uh, they can be very damaging in themselves. So this is pretty obvious. You know, they're chewing on all parts of it. They're uh, even eating some of the holes in the leaves, um, voracious uh, leaf feeders. Now, some insects, they make very diagnostic or characteristic uh, uh, feeding patterns. So 
things like the root weevils, whether it's the uh, black vine weevil, the lilac root weevil, rough strawberry root weevil, uh, those types of things, uh, their adults make these notches in leaves. And so uh, they're nocturnal. So sometimes you don't see them doing this. And uh, you might see other insects out there on your plants that are, are uh, innocent or even beneficial, and you might attribute the damage to them. But this is a diagnostic character of the root weevils. So uh, again, the, they are not native species. They uh, have been introduced via the plant trade, mainly by uh, their larva being in the soil of potted plants. And probably just about every lilac hedge in Wyoming has an infestation of lilac root weevil now. And they can be a serious problem for new transplants of other species uh, or, or plants that are susceptible to them. And they have a broad host range. And it's not so much the adult feeding as the larva feeding on the roots, because that's where they spend most of their life as is the larva and they feed on the roots. And so uh, they're damaging the roots and then also opening them up for pathogens. So again, uh, you know, it's good to be able to recognize those types of damages. <clears throat> Leaf cutter bees, I generally give them a pass because uh, they're uh, highly effective pollinators. Uh, they are not eating the leaves per se, they are using the leaves to make little chambers. And then they provision that chamber with a ball of uh, pollen and nectar, and then they lay an egg on it. And then uh, the egg hatches. And so they'll do that in a cavity. Uh, sometimes I've seen them uh, in shake roof houses, uh, but most of the time they like holes and stuff. And they uh, will make these little chambers and they use the ovals for the sides and then they cap it with a little round, perfectly round thing. They can come in there and with their little sharp mandibles, trim out these holes in less than a minute, you know, in seconds actually, and then carry that off back to the, where they're doing the, their nest. Now most plants really can withstand pretty heavy defoliation, but certainly, uh, especially in areas, say if you're near uh, uh, alfalfa seed production, leaf cutters, can be problematic because uh, you know, they're, they're uh, high population there and can chew on things like lilacs or aster or roses and, and damage the leaves. Another style of feeding is called skeletonization. And so they eat the tender parts in between the leaf veins and, and can be very diagnostic in this case. This is um, uh, the alfalfa uh, weevil larvae do this. Uh, many of the leaf feeding uh, beetle larvae uh, do this on say our tree leaves and leave behind those uh, uh, veins and cause damage. Uh, other insects such as grasshoppers, you know, they have very strong mandibles, can do a lot of leaf feeding. They can also cut a lot of leaves and damage way more than they actually consume. And then even worse than that, they can damage the, the farming grain uh, uh, on say the corn or on uh, small grains, they can go up and they'll clip the head off as it's drying down and then uh, there'll be some moisture come up that stem and, and often in hot, dry conditions in late summer, that's what they're looking for. But they drop that head of grain on the ground, making it unavailable to harvest. Uh, insects can cause problems due to fouling. And so these climbing cutworms, you know, they're chewing on this plant, but they're also fouling it with uh, their uh, feces. Uh, and then uh, you also have shot holes where it looks like somebody's either shot it with a BB gun or poked holes. Uh, this is a corn leaf as it's unfurled. And so this is European corn borer evidence. And then the larva is inside the, the stalk causing damage there. It's where the ear of corn attaches to the stalk. It can cause that ear to fall over or fall off. Uh, sometimes the, the insects will feed on just uh, leaf surface. And uh, in our dry climate, a lot of times that will flake out and it might look more like you know, shot holing or regular damage. But uh, so this is like cabbage white butterflies do this. And, and again, you can see where the damage is uh, flaking and falling off. Now, these black things are not uh, the caterpillar species. In this case, this caterpillar does not turn around and eat their larval exoskeleton that it's molted. Uh, so those are, you know, it, as they grew, they molted and they left those behind. 
Hey, Scott. Yes. Uh, we had a question in the chat box. What is the plant the leaf cutter ant is cutting circles out of? Uh, let's see. I think that uh, this one is probably a rose, and then this is a honeysuckle, it looks like. Thanks. Sure. I was lucky because I usually know my bugs better than I know my plants. Um, so leaf eating can also occur on the underside. So when you're out inspecting your garden, you, you know, yeah, you, it's nice to go out and watch your garden grow, but you also ought to be looking through it. You know, do I have aphids? Okay, if I've got aphids, do I have their predators? What, what kind of uh, uh, things are going on? Uh, oh, the tops of my leaves look fine, but then you flip them over. And then uh, in this case, on beans, you would have Mexican bean beetle larva, and they feed on the underside of leaves. Uh, and so uh, this shape and form of the adult should look familiar to them because this is the black sheep of the lady beetle family. So they're the plant feeders of the lady beetle family, which the vast majority are predations. You can also uh, see defoliation along with silk. Uh, in the case of Western tent caterpillar, uh, they uh, overwinter as egg masses laid on the branches of suitable host plants by the adults. Most people uh, never see or notice the Western tent caterpillar adult moth. Uh, <clears throat> the eggs hatch in the spring, and uh, as they, they group together and they produce this uh, webbing, and it provides them a place to shelter during the day, protects them from the weather, also discourages uh, predation. And, and then they feed at night, usually go out away from that webbing and come back and add more webbing onto it. And uh, at the end, when they're fully developed, they'll disperse and they'll crawl off and pupate away from that. Uh, the caterpillars, uh, because they're native, they usually go in cycles and, and don't last for that long. They also only have one generation per year. So it's not uh, where you know, they've defoliated these aspen trees in this photo, but the aspen, like most trees, if they are healthy and unstressed in other ways, can successfully set a new set of leaves, and so it won't kill them. Now, rap, you know, certainly uh, uh, multiple year defoliation will cause stress and eventually kill them. Some. But in this case, uh, usually they don't uh, sustain their outbreaks for that long before native predators and parasitoids uh, dampen them down. <clears throat> This is what the thrips do. A lot of times you'll notice the change in the coloration on the plant leaves or the petals of flowers uh, caused by the thrips. Uh, the other thing that they do is they kind of produce a black tarry excrement on the leaves. So even if the thrips uh, are gone, that's left behind. They have a scraping mouth part and will feed on the plant juices uh, they produce So uh, uh, with their scrapes. Uh, the uh, spider mites are another one that produce silk. Uh, you generally have to look kind of closely. You'll often see discoloration on the leaves first from their feeding where they suck the silk contents out with piercing sucking uh, uh, mouth parts. <laughs> it's worse when they attack your uh, fruit. They cause malformation and, and essentially, I don't think you can get much at the farmer's market for these strawberries after the uh, two spotted spider mites got through with them. Uh, Two spotted spider mites are probably our most common one on, on uh, broadleaf plants, uh, the broad host range. These spheres are the eggs of the two spotted spider mites. So that's a pretty big egg that they produce. And they can uh, reproduce rather rapidly. <clears throat> they can often flare after an insecticide application because uh, they're not susceptible to all insecticides. Uh, one of the ones that's notorious for that is the uh, old product called Seven, uh, where the active ingredient is uh, called carbaryl. And uh, it can kill things like minute pirate bugs, which are big time predators of spider mites, and not kill the spider mites itself. And so then you get what's called a flare, and uh, they'll, they'll cause a, a real problem. There are some uh, various uh, species of uh, aphids and thrips, and uh, also plant mites that can cause leaf curling and distortions. Uh, where they'll, they'll actually modify the leaf to provide them physical protection and curl it around. 
makes it difficult to either apply an insecticide to get to them or uh, you know, insecticidal soap or even just a high pressure jet of water to get in there. It also protects them from rain events. Uh, in many cases, uh, years where you get a lot of heavy thunderstorms, you don't get as many like the cottonwood leaf aphids in towns because the, the driving rain washes the cottonwood leaf or aphids off the plants. They're, they're, they're kind of fragile. The insects that have piercing and sucking uh, beaks uh, will suck the cell contents out and cause uh, these dottings on plants. Uh, if they do that on fruit, uh, it often causes you know, browning and, and it gives a place for rot to start on fruits. Uh, we have not found the brown marmorated stink bug in Wyoming yet. I think as far as I know, knock on wood, it's not here in Wyoming yet and it's not in Montana yet. It's in Colorado and it's in Utah and it can be very problematic. It feeds on a lot of different things. It also attacks the fruit of a lot of different uh, plants and so uh, really can be damaging. You know, other, other types of uh, uh, plant feeding bugs, you know, myriads are, are a common one, especially this time of year, we get some species that will uh, invade houses. Uh, uh, they, you know, their population just kind of explodes with the early season green up. And then as things dry up and get warm, they uh, are kind of looking for a place to shelter and they can uh, invade houses. There's also many of what used to be the homopterans that can vector disease as they feed. And so one of the most notorious ones is the uh, glassy wing sharpshooter. It's a native to North America, but southeastern North America, uh, it, where it fed on native grape species. And it's a vector of Pierce's disease. And unfortunately, like the European grapevine varieties that are grown out in California are susceptible uh, to it and die from it. And it, unfortunately, the glass wing sharpshooter was transported to California accidentally and is a major problem in the grape growing region there. The honeydew that uh, some of these uh, insects produce is, uh, you know, the plants can tolerate some of the feeding and loss of phloem, but that honeydew can then be uh, utilized by sooty mold and, and uh, cause problems for the plant too. Now, I talked a little bit about the scale insects, how the first stage is the only thing that looks like an insect. So these are uh, not a great photo. Uh, I need to get try to get some uh, better photos of these things. This is oyster shells, oyster shell scale. It's one of the more common ones. It's on aspen, probably most notorious for it in landscapes. The Tony Aster, uh, broad host range. The the female uh, once they have found a suitable spot on a host plant, they sink sink their mouth parts in there and molt and then they form a waxy covering. And then the, their life cycle is such uh, later on when they are mature, they will mate and then uh, they will produce eggs under this waxy covering. And, that, and that's the form that will overwinter. Uh, at this time of year, if you went out and you checked your plants and you found oyster shell scales, underneath the dead bodies of the females would be the eggs. And they hatch out over a long period of time. That makes them problematic. So you can't wait until they all hatch and treat because by that time, some of them have attached and molted and are impervious to treatment. So again, um, they don't produce honey. This is what the adult male looks like. So it only has two pairs of wings, but it's not a dipteran, it's a homopteran. But uh, uh, that's uh, one of the interesting things about insects, there's always exceptions. <clears throat> then the soft scales. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of them. Um, cotton maple scale. It's not just maple that gets hit. Uh, I think there's over 120 different species of deciduous trees and shrubs that can be suitable hosts. <clears throat> the females will form a big cottony ball full of eggs when they get to that point, and they produce a lot of honeydew. One of the more inconspicuous ones is the striped pine scale. It, it looks like just some sort of natural growth on a twig of a pine tree. Uh, but they do produce honeydew. And in late summer, you'll often see uh, yellow jackets visiting those and they'll be licking the honeydew off of the, uh, the, the striped pine scale. 
And, and then if you look closer, you're like, what are they doing up there? And you'll see that that's what they're up to. And then leaf miners, uh, they'll, they'll sometimes be apparent. Uh, uh, there are patterns in the leaves that they make where they're feeding in between the upper and lower surfaces. And uh, you can see uh, where, say, uh, if I can get the mouse around here, where maybe they were inserted initially, and then they go through, and as they get bigger, they're making a bigger tunnel. The larva will be uh, very flat from top to bottom when they're living in there. And then when they go to pupate, they'll often be normal. Uh, so uh, there are some beetles, some moths and wasps and true fly species that do leaf mite. There's also uh, a lot of plant galls uh, that can be caused either by insects or, or uh, in some cases, mites. Uh, the, uh, some of them are quite striking, you know, like uh, this is an oak apple gall. And then the others are pretty common, like the goldenrod galls. And then uh, some things, uh, probably uh, one of the more common ones we see in Wyoming uh, would be hackberry nipple galls on the leaves of hackberry trees caused by a psyllid, which looks like a, a tiny cross between a cicada and an aphid when they're adults. This is my favorite kind of gall. I, I assumed that uh, maybe Dr. Seuss was in on the design of this gall. Uh, this is called the wool solar gall. Uh, it it uh, is unfortunately not native to Wyoming. Uh, I've only seen it in photos. It can either be bright pink or white or white with pink polka dots. So again, pretty interesting uh, kind of creature. Uh, many of the galls on our ornamental plant leaves are not considered major problems for the plants. Uh, you know, they do steal some of the nutrients and they interfere with the function of portions of the leaf. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, even if they were problematic, they're very difficult to control. Uh, they are not uh, uh, treatable with most systemics. Uh, some of them have a very short period where they might be susceptible to things like horticultural oils. And, and of course, uh, you know, that, that can be difficult to treat on say a large tree. So again, oh, the spittle bugs, uh, probably everybody's seen those and, and uh, what lives in that uh, ball of mucus on the plant is a hemipteran uh, nymph. And so that's, uh, the nymph produces this mucus and uh, when it adult, uh, when it makes it to adulthood, it doesn't need that anymore. It can fly and it's fairly mobile. But the nymphs, they live in this ball of mucus and feed with their piercing sucking mouth bud on the plant. You can generally wash them off the hose and uh, knock to the ground. Uh, they're pretty vulnerable to like ants or some other predators attacking them. Stem borers are really hard to, to uh, recognize because they're inside the plant. And uh, you know, unless you get your pocket knife out and cut the plant open, you're not going to really notice them until some other uh, thing like a windstorm causes it to fall over. So here is one that is in a uh, cottonwood uh, sapling. Uh, this is the European corn borer, right where the ear of corn attaches to the stalk has caused weakening there. And then this is one that's causing more problems for people who are trying to grow uh, raspberries uh, in the state. Uh, this is the rose stem girdler, is the common name for it. Uh, apparently, of, there's a, many of these uh, agrillus species of metallic wood boring beetles, uh, and they, they look a lot alike. They just recently found that one that they thought was the rose stem girdler on currants was not. It's a distinct species. So it seems strange that uh, after all these years, this particular insect is causing problems uh, in raspberries, whereas before it was thought to be kind of a minor pest. Uh, so. Again, uh, it, 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 the larva uh, is laid, uh, or the egg is laid on the bark, or uh, egg hatches and the larva go right out the bottom of the egg into the bark and under the bark. And then it spirals around two or three times and girdles that uh, cane and then chews its way into the pit and essentially kills that cane from the entry point. And, and so you can see it do a lot of damage to uh, the raspberry patch. White pine weevil is another one you'll, you'll see 
occasionally in the forest. Uh, it's a notorious pest of like Christmas tree climbers. You can see how it'd be very deforming to your Christmas tree. The larvae are chewing inside that uh, those new twigs and it causes the shepherd's crook to form. So that's a weevil and that's the adult form, but it's the larva that are doing the damage. Emerald ash borer already talked about that. It's one we should be keeping our eye out for. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of native ash in Wyoming. Uh, ash trees are, uh, you know, a nice uh, urban shade tree, and we want to preserve them as much as possible. Uh, once you get emerald ash borer into a town, uh, you pretty much have to use systemics to keep your ash trees alive. So uh, the, uh, the closest we have them to Wyoming is in uh, the uh, Boulder and Fort Collins region, Fort Collins, Colorado region now. Uh, they're also moving closer from the east in Nebraska. So again, uh, beautiful little beetles, but highly destructive because of the, of the mortality they cause in ash trees. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle is one, uh, another introduced pest that bores inside of trees, a rather large insect. Um, you will not notice much problems they're causing in the trees until they uh, fall over in the windstorm. Uh, maple is the preferred host, but they'll also hit elm, birch, willow, and poplar. And our native maple is uh, box elder, it's acer, maroon grove, uh, uh, so it's uh, um, a suitable host for them. So if, if they would eliminated it in a few places back east where it was found, uh, but um, they recently had a new discovery of an infestation in the Carolinas. So uh, it, it's not as bad as the emerald ash borer, but it's certainly a major pest. Sometimes we get bees, and of course last summer uh, was the uh, killer hornet uh, craze and uh, some people were submitting these and these are pigeon chemex. So it's a horn tail. Uh, it's a type of soft fly. So it is a, a member of the hymenoptera. It has a broad connection between its thorax and waist. And this is used for inserting eggs under the bark of dead or dying trees. So they're not a tree killer itself. And then the larva uh, will chew on that freshly dead wood and you know, decay and, and slowly uh, develop into a rather large insect, probably about an inch and a half from the head to the end of the abdomen. So again, something to note. Bark beetles, mountain pine beetle, uh, they're still probably, uh, you know, it exists in low populations all the time. You know, then we had a big outbreak of it. And there might be some areas of uh, our, our pine forests in Wyoming that are still uh, susceptible to it. In the Snowy Range, close to where I live, uh, they pretty much ate themselves out of house and home. Uh, they, they killed most of the susceptible trees. And so uh, what was left behind were uh, you know, trees that were too young and had too thin a cambium layer to be suitable hosts for the mountain pine beetle. Uh, there's also species that say attack spruce or, or uh, subalpine fir. Uh, those types of things. Uh, so there are still some uh, mortality going on in different uh, tree species. Uh, but uh, the big mountain pine beetle outbreak in most of Wyoming is subsiding. Some really good uh, guides that are uh, out there um, that are, are very effective because they're for our region uh, are available. Insects and diseases of woody plants in Colorado. It might be available through uh, uh, Chance's office. Uh, it's also worthwhile having for your own personal library. It's relatively expensive, but considering the quality of the publication and its color plates, this was redone and they added a lot of photos to it. Um, it, uh, uh, it was done by Whitney Cranshaw and it includes diseases. It used to be called uh, Insects and Diseases of the Central Rockies, but uh, they redid it. They, they just put Colorado in there. And then uh, this one, a field guide to diseases and insects of the Rocky Mountain region, it's no longer in print, but it's available as a PDF document. It can be downloaded and, and uh, printed. And those are those are on the university website, or where do they find that the, the download? Uh, the the download, I'll, I'll have to send you a link 
to it. Uh, they, they keep, they're like the university and they keep changing web addresses. And so when I uh, went to the address the last time, it would have been, it was a 404 page error. Uh, so I'll have to find it again. Uh, I've got it written on a sticky note to relocate that, that one. The other one is like 40 bucks from the CSU bulletin room. All right, I'll write that down. Yeah, and uh, so we got a photo quiz here I, that you know, not being in person, it's kind of hard to ask, but based on what I've told you tonight, here's a nymph grasshopper. The, this grass, it should be bright green, is, is crested wheat grass. And then we have over here a hemipteran. And so which of these insects caused the problem? Well, you can actually see the beak of the synitrin is down getting ready to feed. So this is a black grass bug. And this is kind of an interesting situation. You know, I talked about pests tonight. I talked about uh, you know, many of them were introduced without their predators and parasitoids. In this case, this is a native insect that likes to feed on introduced uh, grasses such as crested wheatgrass and intermediate wheatgrass. And it can go into a pure stand of that, and its population can explode. Because I think it leaves behind a lot of its predators in the native prairie. Because out on the native prairie, yeah, you you can find it, but it's not nearly as common as it is in in say uh, an improved pasture of crested wheatgrass or intermediate wheatgrass. And uh, you know they can just they suck all the cell content out and make that grass pretty non-nutritious for livestock to feed on. So with that, is, are there any questions? All right, so let's take another, what, uh, another like five minute break, just kind of get up and stretch. And if you think of any questions, let me know and uh, have uh, uh, one more uh, little presentation on identifying insects that maybe where you don't have uh, the plant to go with it. Uh, it's an uh, interactive uh, 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 type of identification tool, and we'll go from there. So, five minute break. Okay. Yeah.
Wonderland. Well, I'm ready to go if, if you are. I think we're all ready to go here, so. Okay, sounds good. I uh, wanted to uh, tell you about a, a newer method of identifying insects tonight. Uh, it's uh, called an interactive app, or um, in many cases, uh, it's referred to as a Lucid app because uh, the company that first, the software company that first developed it is Lucid. And, uh, you know, I've already talked somewhat about this, uh, about, you know, the diagnostic characters of an insect. You know, that's one of the first things you kind of have to do is make sure that what you're trying to identify is an insect to make sure that your key will work for it. Uh, we uh, uh, don't need to go through all this again. I think uh, we'll just skip right to the, uh, how to utilize the lucid key and what are all the alternatives. Now, uh, the guidebooks are certainly uh, good, uh, and, and I use them a lot myself. Uh, many of them have a thumb tab or pictorial table of contents that can be useful. The uh, uh, dichotomous uh, two-choice uh, keys uh, are useful, and that's what a lot of, of the scientific uh, uh, you know, advanced keys are, are done uh, by that method, and they are problematic in that if you run into something that stumps you, then you're done. You can't skip on ahead. The superiority of the lucid key that I'm going to demonstrate for you is if you can't see a feature that it asks about, well, just skip it. 
just go on and identify other diagnostic characters that you can see. Um, so this is one that's uh, um, available at the uh, discoverlife.website and it's under their IV nature guides. And so this is what the page looks like uh, for the uh, 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 Discover Life website and the IV nature guides are here. This is the website address. It's a pretty ambitious website in that they're trying to catalog all of the life on the eventually that's now, uh, we're going to do the insect order then. So you would go there and when you choose the insect order, uh, you bring up a page that like this. It has uh, all of these pictures and, and questions about diagnostic characters such as wing number, wing shape, wing texture. I told you that wings are very important for determining insect order. Here's all the instructions right up here. It's very basic. Uh, when you start out trying to figure out what your creature's order is, then you have 31 different kinds to go through. As you choose these characters, uh, you will narrow down these fields because the insects uh, you know, don't have all of the characters. They're not universal. So uh, that's the nice thing about it. And like I say, you don't have to go sequ sequential. And if you can't see the feature that they're talking about, you can ignore it. Um, you can also hit uh, simplify and uncheck orders that you know are wrong. Uh, you can also compare thumbnail images of the possible orders, and that helps you narrow it down pretty rapidly. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about this is it gives an explanation. If you click on these uh, uh, diagrams, then uh, like on this first one, here it gives a, a, a bigger picture and an explanation of the feature that it's talking about. So again, uh, it's a pretty easy to use and uh, I'll follow along with a, uh, a made up case of a person submitting a photo to me. Because in many cases, I can make identifications if I have good photos of the diagnostic characters and I can get information about where you found it, uh, what you found it on. This is really important with plant pests because many times insects maybe only eat two or three different kinds of plants. And so if I know what the plant is uh, and the time of year and location and have some good photos, I can generally make an identification without actually having to get the specimen. So in this case, somebody sent me a picture and says, what is this thing eating my pear? So we'll run it through the key and see what order it belongs to. Now, uh, we can see here that it does have wings. And if we look really closely, we can see four wings because they overlap each other. And, and you can see just the ends uh, here. So uh, that's different from the two pair or the having uh, the hind pair reduced to tiny clubs or absent or uh, four or absent in totality. So we would choose four because we can see four. Um, maybe the next feature, uh, you know, yeah, we can't really tell wing shape, maybe wing texture, wing development would definitely have well-developed wings. So we'll choose that one. Whoops, too fast. Yeah, so then it asks you more questions. Wing venation, many wing veins, cross veins, uh, wing bases, uh, four legs. Uh, we can see the four legs really well here. So let's go with that one. Uh, the hind legs, well, they don't appear to be grasshopper-like, so let's choose that one. So like I said, you don't have to choose some of these features that you can't see. Uh, either they're, they're hidden in the photo, uh, you can just skip them. Uh, tarsimere number, remember, uh, tarsi, or tarsimere is the uh, singular of that. Uh, it asks you about how many you have. Can't really see how many uh, segments there are, so we'll ignore that. Uh, how about the Pitaris? Yeah, can't really see that very well on this particular one. Head shape, uh, yeah, can't, can't tell. Um, the um, next would be the antenna. We can see that rather well. Segments are filiform. 
and then mouth parts. Obviously, it's been chewing that pear, so it has external chewing glands. Uh, palps. We can see palps, and palps, uh, like say, if you aren't certain what they're talking about, just click on these, and uh, the palps are uh, like a, a feeler that's near their mouth parts. You can see this. This is the palp, so it does have that. And uh, body regions, head, thorax, abdomen. You can see the abdominal segments. You can see the thorax is where the legs and wings originate. So that's all good. Uh, body shape. Yeah, it does look kind of broad and flattened uh, versus being compressed like a flea. They're, they're, so they can fit through the hair coat on an animal. Uh, so let's go with broad and flattened. Pronotum shape. That's like a collar behind the head. Uh, grasshoppers and, and, and of course this insect has it too uh, versus some of the other ones that don't. So uh, how about uh, abdominal base broadly attached to the thorax versus a wasp wings. So it's broadly attached. So Circe, now let's talk about that. Uh, you know, like earwigs have the hard pincer-like Circe. Uh, this particular insect does have Circe back here. Uh, it's hard to really tell. It's certainly uh, more than absent. Uh, short with one or two segments. I'm thinking it's probably longer than that. Uh, it looks a lot like that, so we will choose that. And then abdominal apex. Uh, doesn't seem to have any filaments like, say, a mayfly would have, or a fire brat, or a, uh, a, a jumping organ like a columbula would have. Uh, no long single filament sticking out the back. So let's go with simple. And then we would hit search. And it eliminated all the different orders except for Blateria, which is the order that cockroaches are in. And so then if you clicked on the uh, 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 pop-up for the, this particular order, this is what it brings up. You can see it's a very good match. This is the American cockroach. So there are other apps out there uh, the one of Bug Guide is kind of a really simplified one. Uh, it's Bug Guide is a really uh, great place to learn about other arthropods. It also includes a lot of information about the immature stages. Uh, the other thing about Discover Life site is it has a whole bunch of information on plants, uh, uh, vertebrates such as uh, frogs and lizards, those types of things. So again. Uh, uh, Kind of useful if you have an interest in uh, nature. Uh, the uh, this is what the bug guide website looks like. So you can do this clickable guide based on kind of an overview of your creature that you've got, and then from there you can learn all about these different uh, creatures. It's uh, uh, run out of Iowa State University, so uh, and it has incredibly uh, talented experts that contribute to it. Uh, they, uh, it's pretty amazing. Like say, most entomologists uh, can really only specialize in maybe a family or two uh, and really know them that well, where they can just look at them and say, oh yeah, that's what that is. Uh, so there's many of those uh, types of folks that are contributing to this website. So any questions about identifying insects? You might have noticed that I uploaded uh, to your um, uh, chat box an insect ID homework that uh, we can go over. The uh, if I can find the uh, I'll open it up here and bring it up. So. What you'll have to do is there's three specimens that you'll use the interactive key to identify the order, the scientific name of the order. And there's a little clues in the description about them because that's always good. I, I tell people I've never told anybody, you know, you provide me way too much information about this insect. How am I supposed to make an identification? It's usually the other way. It's like, uh, where did you find it at? Where did you find it on? Those types of things. And so I gave some little clues in the descriptions. And then the fourth one 
you'll need to utilize the uh, uh, plant pest guide that I supplied you from the uh, Garden Insects of North America book. This is what it, uh, Garden Insects of North America, it's a great book to have. You can get um, these on Amazon relatively cheap. In many cases, they can be had used. Uh, there's some college courses that utilize them. And uh, so they might not have ever been open. Uh, so the, this, this is a simulated master gardener type question that you might get. Say you get an email because you're now a master gardener and uh, this is a question that you might get. And these are the kind of photos you might get. So one kind of a blurry one and then one of a finger and then finally you get a good one. So that's, uh, you, you can read through that and uh, answer these uh, four questions and uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let Chance work on it too. And then uh, uh, I'll, if he can send me his answers on, I'll let him know if he got them right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. I, would you be able to, um, yeah, I know you sent it in the chat box. Would you be able to email all of this stuff too so we can make sure we get everything that we need to get out to everybody? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I think I've already sent the Garden Insects of North America uh, plant pest key to Rachel, uh, but I don't okay. know if I sent the, uh, the uh, this exercise for her. Okay, okay. So, yeah, unfortunately not being able to be there, uh, if, 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 if I can in the future come, let's see, why is it, I can't escape from this, there we go. Uh, I can do an interactive uh, uh, thing with people uh, and actual specimens. And I know people like to do that, uh, but this is uh, the next best thing. And certainly uh, the, uh, that key, uh, let me bring up the actual website. So the ID Nature Guides, it's pretty fascinating, you know, what they're doing here. So uh, say, you know, I, I, I don't think many master gardeners like flowers, but just in case there are some people that like wildflowers, let's look what they have for the wildflowers in North America. Come on, bring it up here. So, so you can go in there and then based on your location, like Wyoming, they have 822 species uh, that are listed. And then here you go again, this is a interactive key that utilizing the features that you can see on the plant uh, can be really uh, uh, useful for determining the plant. I mean, you're probably not gonna be 100%, but uh, certainly it, it can be uh, also a learning tool because you can click on these things and, and learn about you know, the, the various features. So this uh, talking about radial symmetry, it gives them an explanation with a picture of it. So it's really a, a, a useful tool here. The other thing that I wanted to also uh, talk a little bit about, and if I can find the, uh, let's see here. I know, uh, you know, with Chance there, uh, you know, you'll go through him if you have to do a submission, uh, but uh, one of the things that can be really helpful is taking good photos. And so um, at the, uh, I think most offices got an iPad that can take pretty darn good photos. So this is taking a photo of a small, this is a Clemens clandestine dart moth. And this is uh, a relatively large insect and I'm just using the camera on the iPad. And I've got it set up on a couple coffee cups as a makeshift tripod. And, and you wanna provide good light. You know, that's a, uh, always a good thing to have with a photograph to get uh, crisp details is good light. You try not to have too much shadows and contrast. And you can see here, you know, that's my fancy tripod, just a couple of coffee cups. And then that's the Miller moth that I was taking the picture of. You can also utilize your cell phones. Most of the uh, smartphones have 
within the accessibility menu of Magnifier app. And the latest update on the iPhone actually did something useful. They really did a nice job in updating the uh, Magnifier app on, on the uh, cell phone. So I also utilize a coffee cup to study my uh, smartphone. And then uh, with the Magnifier app on, you can turn on and illuminate it. It has built-in illumination. You can capture this as a photo and then send it. Uh, uh, so it makes it really handy for doing these things. You can also utilize it for plan ID because uh, you know, this is only partial uh, magnification that's available here. <clears throat> you can see these are a couple of uh, wood ticks or uh, Rocky Mountain wood ticks in the center Anderson eye. You can see it's only about halfway on its magnification and you can see a lot of the features in detail with your smartphone. Uh, so like I say, this is an iPhone. Uh, the droids also have this. Uh, when I had a droid phone quite a long time ago, uh, I downloaded a free app and it was pretty nice. Uh, I don't know what it's like. It probably depends on your phone manufacturer. But uh, what what these are is called the magnifier app. And uh, this one is, uh, like I say, it, they really did an improvement on it uh, with the recent update. Then also at uh, your office, I don't know, Chance, do you have the ProScope attachment that goes on the iPad? I do, yeah. And I've used it a lot and uh, taken taking lots of pictures and, and sent them to you. And um, yeah, it's actually kind of, I, one of the, one of the little rubber deals on the end fell off of the, of the case, but I still use it a lot for sure. Yeah. I, I had trouble with the rubber feet coming off on mine too, but it's, it's really nice. You have to have something small enough, you know, probably no bigger than a dime diameter fit under that, but it, it provides, um, uh, a lot of magnification. So those are the two ticks uh, with it only partially magnified. So again, uh, it's really good for small creatures where you have to see a lot of detail and ticks are one of those uh, generally for identification on them. They have a what's called a spiracular plate on the side of their abdomen and that's what allows oxygen into their body. And so after you've looked at their head and mouth parts and those types of things, you get down through the dichotomous key and you have to look at the spiracular plate. And uh, the other thing that's handy, I should mention that uh, uh, it was shown to me many, many years ago is a lot of times insects when they're dry or in this case ticks, uh, you know, you need to get them in a funny angle to see what you're looking at. If you get some like white aquarium sand and put it in a little container, then you can stick the body in there. So like if you have to look at the side of this tick, you know, they're really flat. And so it's hard to get them to stay on their edge. But if you stick them inside a little bit of sand, that'll prop them up. And uh, uh, that, that can be really useful for taking uh, good photos of these uh, things. But again, this is a really useful tool for identification. And uh, I think it saves us a lot of time, uh, you know, shipping specimens and, and getting fast responses for your clients. So again, the other thing that's nice are these little plastic Petri dishes uh, for uh, capturing stuff. You can stick a specimen in there, uh, and you, you know if you if you want to kill it, you can stick it in the freezer, or you can stick it in the refrigerator so it's not uh, killed, you know, but it's stunned, it's cold stunned, and then you can get good pictures with it uh, uh, as a nice little container. So again, uh, the magnifier app is uh, really handy, and uh, uh, like I say it's it, and if you don't have a good one on your phone, you can. Uh, go to the app store, either the Droid app store or the iPhone app store. And uh, there's, you know, look at the reviews and, and get yourself one. So again, this is a part of a, a presentation I added to uh, the uh, National uh, Plant De Detection Network. And um, uh, it's a, a consortium of uh, all sorts of uh, land grant universities who have uh, diagnostic labs. And so uh, in the future, uh, if I make a visit up there uh, to do, say, an advanced master gardener training, uh, I can give you uh, some additional uh, uh, hints. But again, that's the heart of it is you know, taking good photos and pro providing information about 
where it was collected and who collected it so, with their contact information so we can follow up with them and uh, uh, you know especially the plant and then any damage that you're seeing because in some cases you know it, it, maybe it's a pathogen and it's not an insect that's doing it but you know if you know the plant uh, species certainly include that with any kind of uh, uh, sample submissions yeah yeah scott i think that's a um a really good point a lot of times you know somebody brings me something and i'm not sure whether it's from an insect pest or a bacteria or or what's causing the problem. And I use this iPad microscope tool or my iPhone and take pictures of it. And, and you do work with, I mean, people on campus like Bill Stomp or Chris Hilgert or, or Karen Panter to kind of as a diagnostic team to kind of throw around ideas of what what's going wrong, right? Oh yeah, yeah, we, we definitely do because sometimes it's not real obvious. And it's also good, you know, these kind of uh, uh, close-ups are good, but it's also good to have a, a backed off shot. That really helps Karen and Chris because then they can look at the whole situation. Say you've got a tree that's fading or uh, exhibiting some bad condition and you take a look back and then you can see, well, there's, you know, there's all the grass under it's brown. And usually, you know, grass stays green as a tree dies and if the grass is brown too then they're both dying of lack of water or something and and so yeah getting uh, uh, good shots of uh, where the plant's growing and then close-ups of the damage and then any suspected uh, pests uh, you know that like I say I've never never had to say oh you provided me way too much information how can I do this diagnostic uh, and so you know even if you think it may be inconsequential uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's, um, uh, it could be, uh, I, I went and did a, a yard visit. I was up in Douglas, Wyoming for another thing. And uh, at the time, the extension educator said, could you uh, go out with me to look at some trees? And we went out to uh, some evergreen trees and they had this white lumpy stuff around the base. And it, it, there was even a few clumps in the, and it's like, well, that looks like lime. And it turned out that the homeowner had come under the impression that, well, uh, uh, pine trees you know, acidify the ground underneath them. And well, that, that wouldn't be good. And he put lime out there. And so, uh, you know, our soils are pretty alkaline anyway. And <laughs> so the poor trees were really suffering from having too alkaline a soil. So again, you know, in this case, he thought it was something attacking the roots. And in a way it was, it, it was a chemical attack on the roots. So. Yeah, it's uh, like I say, it's it's kind of a puzzle. It's like being a, a plant detective in many cases. That's true. Scott, what do you think? I just had another question. What do you think as far, it seems like a lot of times whenever there is like an insect pest or something that depending on what trees or, or what they have in their yard, like there's specific pests that target those specific trees you know like a box elder bug and box elder tree um but is there a, how do you like what i guess what what tree pests do you get called or emailed on the most each year um is there a particular well, one yeah i would uh you know it's it's it, it kind of depends on the uh, the trees. It's like uh, you know, I'd say aspen tree uh, oyster shell scale is uh, a really predominant pest. Uh, with uh, cottonwoods, lately it's been uh, the uh, cottonwood uh, leaf beetle. Uh, with elm trees, in recent years, it's been the elm flea beetle uh, for the uh, uh, Siberian elm. So it really depends on the tree species, which one is the most common. And sometimes they, they uh, uh, fade. Uh, like uh, uh, for a long time, it was the elm leaf beetle on elms. And then hardly got any calls. And then they were kind of replaced by this uh, elm flea weevil. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it, it depends uh, which tree species uh, and then what year it is. Sure. 
All right. Well, I guess uh, uh, it, you'll you'll get out of class a little bit early tonight. I uh, I've, I've run out of steam as far as what I what more I can share with you. Hopefully, you got something useful out of it. I will make sure to send uh, Rachel uh, the homework assignment. Um, uh, and uh, like I say, I'll, I'll go ahead and send that. I'll, I'll ask her if I sent the garden insects of North America. I think I did uh, the plant pest index that goes with that. The first edition, if you can find a copy of it, it it's pretty useful. Uh, it doesn't have as many tree or turf pests in it, but it's really good for gardens and it has a built in plant pest index. And it's also not for, um, you know, it's not an entomologist book per se. Its chapters are arranged on like feeding gamers. So, you know, the, we have the leaf feeders or the uh, sap suckers or root feeders, those types of arrangements. And then the photos that are in that book are, you know, are really good too. They're just not as many as in the second edition. Um, but again, that's, that's a book you can probably find used online for a very modest sum. <clears throat> Yeah, and usually when we uh, usually when we do this and we can have you in person, you bring all kinds of like bugs that we can physically look at, and that's kind of cool. But I I thought it was awesome that you had so many great pictures in your presentations, and that that really helped. And um, you did a nice job. Thanks, Scott. Well, yeah, uh, I'm happy to do it. Like I say, it's uh, uh, you know in a way uh, I would be happy to drive up there. Uh, I have that. A meeting I had to attend today uh, and I wouldn't have been able to come up anyway, but the weather's so bad I wouldn't have been able to come anyway. So this is uh, better than nothing, I, I would say. Uh, <laughs> one other book that I, sh I should point out, it's really good for gardeners if you can get it um, used because it's out of print. It's called The Pests of the West by Whitney Crenshaw. And uh, it's an excellent book for gardeners to have in their library. Let me see if I can hold that still. There we go. So Pests of the West, and uh, it's got a lot of information on common garden crops and then the, the pests or diseases and the uh, uh, organic controls and cultural controls and a little bit about chemical controls, the life history of the pests. Uh, it, it's another really good uh, thing to have in your reference library. Okay. Alrighty, well, you guys have a, a good evening, and uh, you know that's that's one thing uh, I I do not mind getting uh, photos of insects in my email. Uh, that's way better than what the university usually sends me. So I'm always happy to uh, try to respond and uh, have something to do with insects during my workday. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Scott. I don't I don't see any. Uh other questions. So um, I appreciate it. And uh, I'll pass along all the info that you, you get to us to everybody um, that, uh, that, that participated today. So thanks a lot. And we'll call it a night. Sounds good, Chance. We'll see you down the road. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>